presentation is sort of taken from some presentations that I used to do um, in Michigan when I was running my own food business. Um, but there was a really rich culture of people that were doing a variety of different types of food businesses, everything from urban, urban agriculture um, to value-added goods to pop-up restaurants. Um, and there was a real divide between people who had a certain amount of base knowledge and then people who um, didn't really know, you know, what to do to get their businesses off the ground to be really successful, and they would fall um, into certain gray areas or just um, you know, fail because so many businesses go within the first year of operation. So I wanted to start, since we're sort of a small group as well, um, with just kind of a, a basic writing exercise. Uh, so if you could just take five to 10 minutes to just think of a business either in your community right now or um, in a community that you've lived in before, that's a community enterprise that you really loved, and just answer these two questions. You know, what is it about this business that you really love? And then, is this business successful? Why or why not? And then, once you write it down, we can get together and share. If anybody needs writing utensils, let me know. As a lawyer, I have many pens. <laughs> Hello, since you just walked in, we're just doing a little writing exercise. We'll just take a couple minutes um, to answer the questions. And then we're going to get into small groups and discuss. Great. Okay. Groups can always be smaller. For example, you can have a presentation panel of one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so if we could just divide into, it looks like three might be a good number, one to four. Okay. Just introduce yourselves. Thank you. 
So what this was a Morocco is a little not called Jabalo Cafe, fresh
One of the neat things that they do now is they have a community pod. And so if you've got a couple extra bucks, you can throw into the community right. pod. And so if somebody comes in, and I've got a bunch of people that are going to be able to put it on the community pod. And it's a really cool place. They also do a lot of work that are very nice in the community, which I really like. And um, we recently are failing to have fundraisers. Oh, could you introduce yourself also? Oh. No, nobody has like uh, you know any proper yeah. introduction on that. Uh, my name is Brad. I'm a third year uh, student at Temple University, so undergraduate student. Um, but uh, yeah, we have two coffee shops in our group, and I think that kind of um, speaks to how we see how we view coffee shops as a very community-oriented mm -hmm. um, business. So I thought that was interesting. One was more successful than the other. Uh, so what? Why was one more successful than the other? Oh, I don't. It was. We both had different locations. Mm -hmm. um, Rochelle was in uh, Durham. Mine was in Lansdale, Pennsylvania, and um, mine was the one that was not as successful because I uh, said that I thought it had too much of a um, narrow target audience. So it was a gluten-free bakery. So it was a specialty shop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and just, just kind of narrowed its its view a little too much despite being on the main strip in the town. And so what was it that made, I mean, yes, everybody likes coffee. I mean, I am guilty of that as well. But what was it about the coffee shop in particular that made it feel like a community space or a community enterprise? Because Starbucks was a coffee shop. I'm not sure if you're aware. <laughs> um, for the one that was, for mine, that was unsuccessful? No. Or just in general. I mean, right. successful or unsuccessful, you love the coffee shop, right? Because right? it's a community feel. But why? And anyone else can jump in. I'm hopefully more than 
just the two of you love coffee shops? <laughs> um, I don't know. For me, I think just because it's it's just a, a place where we kind of tend to gather. Um, everyone, most people drink coffee, so it just tends to be an, an easy invite to grab coffee, and um, it's a part of most people's morning routine to to hit up the local coffee shop before work or something like that. Okay. Uh, Rachel, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I think I work from home a lot too, and so there's a sense of like, this is my office community to some extent, and mm -hmm. so a coffee shop that is willing to have me sit there for a long time also contributes to that feeling of community that's lacking when you're telecommuting. And mm -hmm. Has anyone ever heard of it? Have you heard of the movie Coffee Town? Has anyone heard of this? This is a, an entire comedy completely dedicated to that concept of, of a coffee shop being changed and the person that's like, this is my office, is having yeah, a, my a meltdown down. about it being changed <laughs> into a bistro <laughs> lounge, you know. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, next group. Oh, no, I was there. Okay. I was like, there's four people. Okay. So we actually had all kind of different setups. We drove uh, Kitchen, which is a pretty big restaurant. Um, and Top Butcher, which is just a little popsicle stand, mm -hmm. and then Brand House, that uh, security place. But they all probably the similarity. Yeah, yeah, and it's all like locally sourced mm -hmm. and healthy and home businesses. Yeah. <laughs> so you feel good supporting them? Feels yeah, like yeah. you're buying right. they're delicious. Pretty also delicious. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's delicious. Are they successful? Yeah. Yes. yes. Why? Mine is a specialty, actually. They're vegan. I'm not vegan, but I still, I don't even like vegan, but I can't stop <laughs> this way. They, uh, they do um, juices, they juice and they smoothie, and they smoothie with vegetables, and they smoothie with real fruit and not that jelly stuff that you get at some places that say smoothie. Mm -hmm. I, I just place it for And they're about to move into a bigger plate. Oh, wow. So they're about to move. I don't know where <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Next group. Um, we chose also with Berry Kitchen right here. We two of those. And then we also chose a place in Durham, North Carolina. We chose a non-named catering company slash uh, community that who shall remain nameless. And then an Ethiopian place in Washington, D.C., all food. Mm -hmm. And they had a variety. One of them perhaps pays more attention to its social mission than its, than its, than its, than its commercial mission, but still is a feel-good place. One of them is the right price point, not too fancy. One of them is really good food, but maybe not the best marketing. People don't know that one in D.C. And then Woodbury Kitchen, pricey, but has a really good model um, destination. So, not to be biased because I was in that group, but sort of the, you know, panoply of things that could go wrong, right? Uh, yes, so we chose, we also had two food establishments, but we also had um, a consignment shop and a vet, which um, I thought was very interesting, especially considering how much other food um, <laughs> we all went to. It's easy to just go straight to food. Um, but, I was, um, I was definitely intrigued by the vet one because it is a, a community service. And so whereas it's maybe not a, a community space where people come together, it's still um, something that a lot of people need. Mm -hmm. And that it, when it's provided in a successful way, that's really important to a community. Mm -hmm. um, the things that were successful about our restaurants were the, the obvious things like atmosphere and you know, a good product at a reasonable price, um, but also their participation in the community. So be it fundraisers or just generally being active in the community made them very successful. Great. So I do this exercise mostly to sort of get us thinking about, you know, what makes a place someplace that we love that when it fails, right, it's, it's really egregious and it's hard for us um, and you think, oh, that place was so great. Why didn't it work out? Or why was it so great? Um, because everybody starts with an idea that they really believe in, right? And inevitably, 
the idea of growth, of moving to the next stage, of fundraising becomes, you know, make it or break it no matter how great your idea is, even if the community needs that. Um, my perfect example is when I was living in Detroit, Michigan, I was a law student, I was commuting back and forth from Detroit to Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is 50 miles in the snow in Michigan, uh, which is very hard, and there was one coffee shop in town, right, just one. Right at the time, it was a city of like 730,000 people, 138 square miles, one coffee shop. And you know what happened to that coffee shop? Opened six months. And I was thinking, this is impossible. How is it possible that this had happened? Um, and they just did not have the financing to keep it going. And then later on, when I started Motor City Masala with a friend of mine, um, and when we used to talk to other emerging food enterprises, a lot of them said the biggest problem was financing, that they heard all of these things, but they couldn't figure out how to capitalize on it, and that strange art installations would raise $50,000 on Kickstarter, you know, but their business that was, you know, that you know, was making baked goods that were oftentimes gluten-free or something else could not find a foothold. So what do we do to overcome this problem? So um, it's not everything is a success, right? Money is hard to come by. You know, the recession is still not over, no matter what the government tells you. So, you know, we have to think creatively about this. And this is just meant to be sort of an introduction, both for lawyers and entrepreneurs, into some of the basics of the issues. So I use a little hypo, um, which is Everybody Loves Raisins, my fictional food business, uh, which is run by Miss Ray. So Miss Ray makes these healthy snack boxes. It's a cottage industry, which means that she produces it at home. Um, and so she sells it at farmer's markets. You know, so far it's doing really well, but she really would like to make it big, make it her full-time job. She definitely wants it to be a for-profit business. You know, she wants it in grocery stores. She wants it to employ people in the community, but she needs money to take it to the next level. So, you know, these are the standard ways you can raise money, right? You can get a standard small business loan, but often this requires three years of credit history. Um, you can bootstrap, right? You can use your own funds. You can do the family plan, friends and family. Uh, you can do crowdsourcing, which is very in right now, right? There are online platforms that help you do it. You can do some direct campaigns. You can do this thing called direct public offerings. The problem is a lot of this triggers um, security laws, uh, which we'll talk about. So um, let's just talk about one example. So Miss Ray knows that she needs this fancy food dehydrator. It costs 500 bucks, which is a lot of money. Uh, and so she mentions it to her friend Lucy. Now she says, hey Lucy, can you give me $500? Um, and I'll give you this piece of paper that says, I owe you $500 uh, and I'm gonna pay it. Love you lots, Miss Ray, right? Um, that is a security, okay? Uh, anytime you ask someone to invest in your business and promise them a return on that investment, whether it's a loan, a share of your profits, stocks or ownership in your business, right? Does love count? Love does not count. You cannot regulate love, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> no. You can only regulate, you know, the other stuff. <laughs> so, um, I was going to make a dirty joke, but then I remembered that they're recording me, so I stopped it. So. <laughs> yeah, I signed a release, so uh, I have to be careful. So, uh, who regulates these things, right? The federal and state governments. And securities are annoying because this whole registration thing can be a real drag, it can be a burden. Uh, so federal laws, right, divide investors into accredited and unaccredited, right, based on how much money you have. So if you have a million dollars in personal wealth, not including your home, please raise your hand so we can be best friends. Um, and you are an accredited investor. Uh, the rest of us who have not raised our hands, right, are unaccredited. Uh, and so a lot of these security laws are actually aimed at us, right, to protect us uh, because we could be potential rubes that invest in unsound things. Uh, so, but there are exceptions uh, that you can take advantage of. So the federal 506B exception um, allows somebody to collect uh, funds from up to 35 different investors over a 12 month period. Um, but, you know, there are some rules, right? First of all, this person can't be a true rube, right? They have to be kind of looking to invest. They have to understand that you are going to either pay them back the money or they, you know, they know what this, this note is um, with the IOU plus the love. Um, and, uh, and also you can't generally solicit 
and advertise for this. Uh, and for some reason, this includes the internet, right? Uh, so that can be a problem with this crowdfunding element, which we'll get back to. So in state law, so I have changed this for Maryland. So the state law is essentially almost identical to the federal law, right? Same 35 unaccredited investors over a 12-month period. They can be Maryland residents um, or residents of other places, which is great. Um, and again, you can't uh, generally advertise or solicit for investment, which means you can't post an ad on Craigslist saying, I need to buy a food dehydrator, you know, willing to give you a really great interest rate plus some love of the emotional variety. Okay, so Miss Ray, uh, again, with Lucy, right? She's mentioning this. Um, and now this qualifies because it qualifies under the Maryland exemption of, you know, as long as she doesn't go and get 40 more people to give her $500, she can get this loan from Lucy. It falls under the exception. Uh, but what about this whole, like, you know, what? This is the whole point of crowdfunding, you know, is to make sure you get the word out there so lots of people can invest in your business. That was the idea of it. So how do we shift this from sort of, you know, the importance of buying local and investing local, of job creation and wealth creation, because everybody loves raisins, wants to hire people from the community. This is the type of business we should want to support. You know, securities laws shouldn't be allowed to drag us down like this, right? Um, so that's why the government created the JOBS Act. Um, ask me if the JOBS Act works. For everybody loves raisins. Does it work? No, it does not work. It does not work. Um, it does not work because what it does is it actually only works for really rich people. Uh, so, so again, you know, they were just worried that we unaccredited rubes would not be able to, you know, fund things on Kickstarter effectively. Uh, and so the Jobs Act created this very narrow exception, right? So you can, you know, this cap of one million over a 12-month 12, 12 period, uh, essentially, this is called 506C. Essentially what it did was it was saying, oh, you want to raise a ton of money over Kickstarter? Not 100% okay. What we'll do instead is we're going to create these completely new Kickstarters where somebody who's really wealthy can say, I want to give as much money as possible, um, but I know that there's security laws, so if I go through this special, you know, completely approved kosher portal, then I can just go wild with my money, right? But those people could go wild with their money anyway, you know? Um, this is my favorite uh, quote from a labor economist, which is, hey man, if rich people wanted to spend more of their money, they could. We don't need to incentivize it. They have all the money in the world, you know? So that's sort of why this didn't really work out. But fortunately, uh, there are other options. So there is Kiva Zip, Prostory.com lending clubs, which are sort of peer-to-peer -peer lending, um, little pools that you can do it. Kiva Zip is actually a nonprofit. Uh, and so you can sign up for these websites. There's also donative crowdfunding, which is what we see all the time, right? So you avoid securities regulations altogether because you're not a rube, you get a tote bag, right? <laughs> once, you in, uh, once you give somebody some money. Uh, so again, like examples of this are Kickstarter, PopLogix. Uh, so this is Miss Ray, right? She starts a Kickstarter campaign. People who donate to her campaign will have a snack named after them, right? Like Priya's parsnip chips. This is completely acceptable. Um, helpful tip. If you actually start a Kickstarter campaign, um, the more unique your little free gift, the better it is. You know, things that people don't care about, tote bags, surprisingly. Um, or like bricks in buildings that are, you know, have their names chiseled on them. They want something unique, you know, that's what makes it go viral. So that's a thought. Okay, so funding strategies. This is the other thing you can do um, is pre-sale crowdfunding, right? So essentially, you are not just giving a tote bag, right? You're saying, what I'm doing is I have an existing business right now. I have an existing smoothie business, and I'm going to give you a gift card that essentially is worth 10, uh, but you only pay for eight, something like that. Uh, so like CSA boxes for a new farm that doesn't exist yet is an example also, or an existing farm. So an obstacle, so this happens in California. I think you guys just have an exception for this, right? That um, sometimes some courts think this is a security because the idea is, hey, Rubes, what if the smoothie business doesn't happen? Then you have a gift card that's worth nothing because it, there are no smoothies being made. Fortunately, in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, we haven't signed on to this. So, you know, keep that in your prayers. Uh, okay, so here's our example with Miss Ray, right? So she 
pre-sale gift cards for the Everybody Loves Raymond, Raymond, Everybody Loves Raisin Snack Boxes. You receive 10 boxes for the price of eight. What a deal. It costs 100 bucks each, right? So, but here, here's the problem for Ms. Ray, right? This is where laws get together and make our lives complicated. There's a cottage food law in Maryland, right? So, you, if you create things in a home kitchen, right, you're limited to $25,000 in annual revenues. It's got to be prepackaged with this the label that includes the name and address of the business, that it's made in a home kitchen, any allergens, you know, all of this information. And where can you sell it in Maryland? Do you know? Can you sell it anywhere? You can only sell at farmers markets and public events. So county fairs, parades. Uh, so. So this is why Ms. Ray has to be careful, right? Because if she's pre-selling things, there is a possibility uh, that the revenues that she generates could be greater than $25,000, depending on when people actually start using their gift cards. So that's the type of thing that we need to be careful of. OK, so funding strategy. So this, this is like a new development that's happening, which is kind of exciting. Uh, so to create community investment, right, there are states that are allowing exceptions when you sell within the state for, or when you create securities within the state, either loans or people buying a part of your business or sharing in your profits, right? So this just passed in Maryland in May, and it goes in effect in October. And it essentially lets you um, ask for a loan or sell an interest in a business or share profits um, and generate money that way so long as um, the business asking your business, like everybody loves raisins, is a Maryland business, right? Is organized and doing business in Maryland, right? And the people that you're selling uh, a share of your profits or uh, an interest in your business uh, or asking loans from are also Maryland residents. Right? Um, and right now, there are no restrictions on advertising. So you could reach out to a large group of people. Um, and right now, you don't have to file any forms, but they are being created as we speak. So it'll probably just be something that you file very easily online. Um, in terms of limits, though, this is not an unlimited pool. You can only raise $100,000 a year. You know, boo-hoo. You know, it's a small change, but it is. And, uh, and each person can only give you $100. But it's a great way to raise money within the state. And there's several other states that do this, California, Washington, Michigan, all the great states that I've lived in. OK, so if Ms. Ray is part of a gardening club, right, that maintains a local community garden, everyone in the club lives in the neighborhood, people know ELR, she's considering fundraising from the group, she can do this under the exception I just talked about, the interstate exception. OK, so finally, we can talk a little bit about actually building a successful campaign, right? So the first is setting reasonable fundraising goals. This is a, a really big problem. Remember that Kickstarter and several other websites, they actually don't give you all your money if you don't meet your goals. You have to be very careful of this. And when advising people, you should tell them to forum shop amongst the different, um, th the different options that they have. GoFundMe, Indiegogo. Uh, of course, like storytelling and making a compelling narrative is also very important, um, as well as crafting the hook, as they say. Um, so, so one of the big problems is that people feel the need to just get something out there as a presence, and this is really bad. You have to actually have spent a lot of time crafting your campaign, crafting your audience, building your brand, right? Creating all the bells and whistles you know you need to. So most of the high-grossing projects on Kickstarter and Indiegogo are actually accompanied by not just a video, but are actually a really well done video. Um, and so in that case, if you're not going to be able to do that for a while, you know, maybe that's a later stage of your funding strategy. Um, so these seem like really simple, simple rules, but this is one of the reasons that a lot of them fail. OK, uh, so a couple of quick things about protecting your brand also. Um, so it's really important, I think, for small businesses to protect their brand without expending more income than they have. So I get a lot of clients who say, do I need to register my trademark? Um, and does anyone know how much trademark registration costs? $25. That's right. $100 for one fifty for each class. Yeah. Like that. And then if you don't have interstate commerce, you have to pay, I think it's $100 for 
100 for class and 150 for each, every six months for each. And so you start selling outside the state, yeah, that would Yeah, that's just called too much money, right? <laughs> yeah, I like to translate that as too much money. So there are other ways to really, to protect your brand without having to do that, right? Which is the, tri the TM symbol, right? So in fact, Starbucks, the mermaid lady, um, that is not a registered trademark. That is just a common law TM trademark that they managed to protect. Um, and then you can do content waivers on your website. And actually, I think one of the most helpful things you can do is create a Google alert. So if you have a catchphrase or you know you have some sort of um, branding that you identify with, so for example, um, uh, like catch and release fishing, right? Or like you know sharing the harvest or something like that. You can do Google alerts for a combination of those words to see if somebody else is sort of stealing your idea, you know, or trying to piggyback off of the work that you've all already done. Um, yes? Can you just explain content waiver? Yes. Yes. So I think a lot of times people, uh, the idea behind content waivers is people will cut and paste from websites. Uh, and so you, if you say that this is a, a copyrighted website, you know, and that content shouldn't be removed, I'm not saying that that will dissuade everybody, but it, it's a helpful thing. I don't know if you, did you have something to add? Okay. Uh, okay, anything else? Okay. Um, so I just want to, Susan, how are we doing on time? I think we're actually slide 20. Okay. So, so I always like to think about like, what we should do and advocate for as lawyers, community members, and entrepreneurs for sort of the next wave. And, um, and one of the things that's really missing in this area that's kind of tough is, um, is we don't have, well, particularly in DC, that there's, that there's sort of a regional identity here as the DMV, but there are not a lot of regional funding options, which is something that we should definitely push for. So I, I like to start with this, the second one first. So regional crowdfunding. So it's really great that Maryland has this exception that you can sell um, securities sort of within people in Maryland, right? But I, I live in DC. It took me just as much time as driving from Detroit to Ann Arbor to get here, you know. And certainly, I'm two miles from the Silver Spring border. You know, it's a pity that I can't support businesses in Silver Spring, right, under the same sort of securities exemptions. I can't give them a hundred dollar loan. Um, and since we do have a regional identity, we should create a regional exception for this rule. Um, the other, the other thing is, has anyone heard of SoFi? Or anything like that. So there are all of these. Um, there are all these organizations that are popping up to do sort of like alumni funding or, uh, or you know, just like commonality funding. So SoFi is a, an organization where if I, I'm an alum of NYU, I can get on SoFi and see if there are any current NYU students who need a, a loan for anything for their student meal plan to buy books, and then I can give them a better loan than what you know Sally Mae can offer them, right? Uh, so it's that type of funding strategy. So wouldn't it be great? If you know you have this amazing gluten-free coffee shop, right? Um, and you, but you don't live anywhere near the gluten-free coffee shop anymore. But you would still like to to give to it as a as an alum of the gluten-free coffee shop world, right? It would be that kind of ability to do like peer-to-peer -peer lending. So that's something also that some places have considered. That's a valid option. Um, so I I don't know how many. Do we have any? Enterprises and entrepreneurs out here? A couple? Like I'm trying to start, you know, I got down to the process and it's wondering that's how I know about the trademark. Mm-hmm. But what they don't tell you is you basically need to, I don't want to get sued in the end or have mm -hmm. to change everything that I just made, but they want you to basically do everything at the state level, establish yourself, get the funding, and then get sued, and then come trademark. You know, you get trademarked after you've been using it, and I feel like that's Productive. Yes, the regulations don't always work, but I mean, I don't know if, since we're being recorded, I'm going to recommend you not speak in detail about the facts of the situation. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, but I think that, that the way that federal trademarks actually work, in fact, I know the way that federal trademarks actually work is that if you're already using it and it's not somebody's registered trademark, they, I mean, you're what's called a pre-existing user. They can't tell you to stop using it when they register. You know, the idea is that anybody who has been using it before them. So how long is the common law trademark that you mentioned a minute ago? How, you know, is it immediate? Is it Yeah, the minute you start using it. Okay. So you could just put TM. 
T M. You cannot put the R. Do not put the R. The R means registered. registered. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just TM is common law. Anyway, TM is common law. Money, you don't have to, like, money. No, okay. no. It's when you start using it, quote unquote, in commerce, right? So it's like right. when you make your business cards and actually, you know, because what are you putting it on, right? So like the, I, I'm assuming if you're putting it on, you know, like say like you're making mugs. If you're putting it on a mug, right, you've already made said mug, right? And then you sold it to me and then I put coffee in it and it was delicious, right? So... <laughs> So, but what, I mean, other than trademark issues, what are, I mean, what are things that, that there are a bunch of lawyers in the room that lawyers can do to help your enterprises? Or just things that you wish that we did or we provided, even if it's FAQs, et cetera. One other business mm. Oh, yeah, I recently raised $100,000 in the you know, 506 b offering. Um, I had a lawyer put together uh, investor materials for me, I guess, investor documents for it. It took a while. Um, I was lucky. I found a, a good local attorney in Raleigh to, to take my case with what I had at the time. But the downside of that is, you know, it took them a month or two, call it a couple months, to get something to me that probably should have only taken them two or three weeks tops. But at the end of the day, you know, you get what you pay for. So that's definitely a challenge. Um, I don't even know if I could use crowdfunding with these uh, these documents. I've just done it through people I know. And Yeah, the securities law thing is definitely an issue. Securities laws, they're unpleasant. If we can avoid them, I highly recommend it. And I'm sure you do as well. Yeah. So is there anything else? I mean, because, you know, I think there's several lawyers who are here who work with legal clinics or just in general. You know, we'd love to hear if there's anything else that you can think of that you need. Well, I'm using a CLC, so that's... So more CLC, yeah. noted. I feel like half the battle is not giving up, right? So remembering that there are a lot of free legal resources and free business resources in general. Um, the Small Business Association often does really, really great free consulting. So do most of the MBA programs here. Um, they do small business plans and things like that that are often very, very helpful. Um, and to never trust a website until you've vetted it several times. That's the you know, do your due diligence. Do as much, use the Google machine, you know. See, read the reviews, see what other people's experiences are. So, I have a question for entrepreneurs. Is I'm allowed Yeah. I'm not really sure. Um, uh, so I, I, in our clinic at the University of Maryland, I see a number of groups who sometimes are not sure to where they are between a not-for-profit and a benefit corporation and an LLC. But I see actually pretty limited thinking about the business plan. So that may not be where you guys are, but I wonder about where people go for business planning assistance to figure out is this going to work? Are the dollars going to work? You know, so that, that would really help me to know how to use it. Are you at the business school? No, you're at the law school. Oh, you're at the law school. I'm actually halfway through my business plan. I would love help. And I have an MBA, but I've never officially wrote my own, and I've never pulled my own shoes up. <laughs> Are you in Maryland or in D.C.? I'm in Maryland. You're I'm actually Maryland. right in the city. Um, I, I work across the street at uh, Biopark. I'm actually on campus also. Yeah. Well, happily, I'm talking with the, the Center for Social Value Creation about how the two schools could work together. Okay. Do you have a <laughs> yeah, this is good. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I don't know if, if any of, of you who are small business owners, or not small business owners, have had success working with networks of small businesses. Because this is something that struck me that could be a way people find out about what works for other people and what's trustworthy. Sometimes that information is very, very good, but. Um, I, I, I say this because yesterday I was, I was in Philadelphia and 
talking to somebody who's executive director of a very large merchants association in Philly, which is a very large city, much larger than either Baltimore or, um, or DC, in which it seemed like it had taken a while to establish this group, but it was really, really valuable to the small businesses because it served as a resource for all sorts of things. It really is kind of a meta networker because the small business owners we've represented, they don't have time themselves to do that kind of information gathering and seeking. They're running the thing. And so the challenge has always been, to, how can you put that information about where to go, what expertise to seek, at what, what's a reasonable price for free at their fingertips? And I've always been surprised that this seems like something that should exist. It should be in small business development centers. It should be, but people do not go there. Is that what happens? People don't go there? Or, or, or they don't have the information? I'm not sure which. Or they go there and they find it's not rewarding. Yeah. So people go and they find that it just doesn't get them where they need. Mm -hmm. They're kind of on their own still, even after they go. Yeah. Do you think like peer to peer networking is more effective? Just find somebody who's done it already, yeah. pick their brain about it, and try not to get them to write it for you. Just you know, come to them with something, get their feedback, come to them with something better, get a little more feedback, let them see that you're clearly doing all of your homework on your own and just hitting them up for you know next level advice and not like the actual work like you have with the business plan. That's exactly what we're doing. Yeah. People are a wealth of information. Yeah. They are so helpful if you're not asking them to do something exactly. for you. Yeah. They're like, oh, you know, call so and so at the Baltimore City Public Schools for green initiatives. <laughs> I mean, people are great if you already know what you want to do. And I, okay, so my scope is too big. So a guy told me, he's like, look, I already do 60% of what you want to do, and it takes 70 hours a week for me to do it. He's like, I need you to bring this circle in. And I, I've heard that my entire life, I don't know how to bring a circle in. But, um, <laughs> but that's just how I am. And But this is the information I'm getting. And every time I go back home, I'm like, I'm going to change this in my plan. And, it, and it's great, and it's painful all at the same time. Um, it's just, I'm an information open. Work. And by yourself, and then it's even harder to find the funding to get people to help you with whatever it needs to be done. And I have people that are willing to help because they know the passion, they see it, and like, what do you want me to do? And I'm like, just give me a second, make that plan. <laughs> right. So one of the great things about business plans that is not a great thing about the law is that the laws can be very state specific, but business, I mean, business is business in most states, right? So there are, especially for food businesses, the Food Lab in Detroit is a is a consortium of individuals who run a variety of food businesses who have come together and sort of put together a lot of those tools. So that's something worth checking out, just their website. And they, I mean, they even do, I think, as of when I left Detroit a year ago, they were doing some remote advising on business plans, review and stuff for no charge. Could someone speak on the, uh, like, the very initial, uh, the first steps to maybe getting into um, a nonprofit organization and trying to, I'm interested in eventually starting an organization, the um, <clears throat> a CDC in Philly that has mm -hmm. um, youth employment built in and also maybe a CSA as like a for-profit subsidiary. Um, can someone speak on like maybe what the initial steps might be in, in that process? Are, are you starting an organization from scratch or? That was, that was what I was mm -hmm. hoping to do, um, but I don't know, I'm just trying to I've also been told to narrow my scope for a long time, so I'm trying to get those kinds of ideas. Um, I realize that's kind of a loaded question to just throw out there, but. Have you looked at comparable organizations? I feel like that's the first step. Yeah. Is there, are there people that are doing this, and what do they look like? Um, yeah, not, not necessarily the, the whole, whole scope of what I'm looking at, but, uh, but yeah, I guess in bits and pieces pulling from different organizations. But. That's what you would suggest. I, I would, those. yeah, I would suggest taking a look at 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 organizations that do the same thing because I mean I can name a couple right off the bat that mm -hmm. do that in, in varying ways, right? Some of them are like church faith based organizations that have grown out from churches. Some of them are um, there's like Youth Corps, which is just, just it's it's actually a straight non uh, straight for profit actually. Um, where they actually have uh, youth learn like business skills, um, 
and like start their own businesses, like selling seeds, you know, and composting, and you know, and then there are outgrowths of other organizations, like the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network has a Grown in Detroit initiative that does similar work, where they have the youth work on the gardens, and then um, and then they run a farm stand, and so it's a component of multiple things. And then I think Homeboy Enterprises had something similar as well, had a had a gardening component. It wasn't youth oriented, but it could be. I mean, since you, I mean, I feel like what I think of as youth and what the government thinks of as youth are two different things. So apparently when you're 18, you're not a youth anymore. So no, I would say differently. I don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in on that. Well, I think there are legal services that you could probably tap uh, for free from an hour at the law schools uh, to assist. But I also think, you know, whether, if you're starting a, a sole proprietorship, maybe you don't need anybody else to make decisions with. But if you're starting a not-for-profit organization, you will need a group of people right. to make all those decisions right. together. Um, and you need to have that before you start getting that assistance. I, I would also say, keep an open mind, right? You don't have to be a nonprofit. You know, there are many ways yeah. to have, I mean, this sounds like, I know this word gets thrown around, but I believe in reclaiming words that have been thrown around, like venture and social enterprise, you know? Like, a social enterprise, as far as I'm concerned, is like a community enterprise, right? It's something that does many things. And so that's what this is, right? And you could be anything. You could be a benefit corporation. You could be you could be a nonprofit. You could be your own thing. You could be a cooperative. You could be whatever. Okay. So you would think about where am I going to get the money? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> hopefully I give you some ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Can we get your PowerPoint? Yeah, sure. OK. Do I just give you my email? I'm pretty sure it's up on the website for this conference. They'll send around a link to all the friends. Okay. We at least have it in the yes in the conference though, so we can figure out how to send it. But I'm you know 26 miles down the road. You know, feel free to stop by, ask me any questions. Oh, I should probably go to my last slide. Oh wait, nope. Oops. Oh no, I did it. Sorry. Previous. On the mouse, did you go to the previous? There is no mouse. <laughs> you, yeah, there is no mouse. Ah, now there is a mouse. There we go. That's me. Well, I think that brings us to time. I'm sorry I kept you a little over. It was lovely meeting all of you. I look forward to patronizing all of your enterprises. <laughs> Thank you for having